Hi, doctor. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, doctor. Hello. Hello. Do you have any questions? Do you have any question before we start? No, doctor, thank you. No questions? No questions. Okay, today we will discuss Emily Dickinson's There came a day. It is J322. Did you read it? Yes, we did. Okay. What is it all about? You have told us at the end of the last session that she says goodbye to her lover, but she said that she would be united through the suffering of Jesus Christ through the suffering of love. Yes. She uses the religious imagery to highlight her love for her dead beloved. Yes, yes. She uses religious imagery to deal with her view of love. Yes, she compares their sufferings to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And at the end, she feels that they will be reunited after death. So they will def defy the grave, just as Jesus Christ defied the grave, i.e. he was resurrected, he came back to life, and the lady and her lover will be united later on. So she uses this religious imagery to deal with the theme of love. Okay, J322. There came a day at summer's full entirely for me. I thought that such were for the saints. Where resurrections be. The sun is calm and went abroad. The flowers accustomed blue, as if no soul the solstice past, that maketh all things new. The time was scarce profaned by speech. The symbol of a word was needless, as at sacrament the wardrobe of our Lord. Each was to each the sealed church, permitted to commune this time, lest we too awkward show at supper of the Lamb. The hours slid fast, as hours will, clutched tight by greedy hands, so faces on two decks look back, bound to opposing will, lands. And so, when all the time had leaked, Without external sound, each bound the other's crucifix. We gave no other bond, sufficient troth that we shall rise, deposed at length the grave to that new marriage justified through Calvary's of love. And Calvary's here means through the sufferings of love. Okay, there came a day at summer's full entirely for me. I thought that such were for the saints where resurrections be. So it is a summer, a summer's day, and this day reminds her 
of the time of resurrection. It is the time for saints. Okay, so here she's dealing with the theme of resurrection. The theme of sainthood. So here she views herself and her lover as two persons who, who will be resurrected as saints of love. Okay? So they will be canonized the saints of love. Canonized, C A N O N I Z E D. Canonization means that declaring that someone is a saint. Okay, canonization means that someone is declared. A saint, i.e., is considered as a saint. This is a Christian uh, concept. And this idea of the saints and the resurrection and the canonization reminds me of Jean Dunn's poem, The Canonization. Are you familiar with John Donne? No. Okay. John Donne, Don D O double N E. This is how we spell Don. John Donne is a 17th English poet. He is one of the metaphysical poets. And metaphysical here doesn't have anything to do with metaphysics. We know that metaphysics deals with transcendental issues, i.e. with things that are beyond our world. Okay, so the metaphysical world is a world that is related to God. Okay, so the metaphysical poets have nothing to do with metaphysics. And the name metaphysical was wrongly given to these poets. <clears throat> okay? The name metaphysical poets was wrongly given to these poets. So that's why critics say that it is a misnomer. Misnomer. M I S. N O M E R. I it is a wrong name. So the name metaphysical poets doesn't indicate that these poets deal with spiritual issues, with transcendental issues that you may have studied in American literature one. Okay? So John Donne is one of the metaphysical poets of the 17th century. In his poems, he deals with love. In many of his poems, he, deal, he deals with love. And many of his poems are addressed uh, to his wife. Okay? His wife died, and he buried his poems with her. Yes, John Donne buried his poems with his wife. Later on, he exhumed them. Exhum is spelled E X H U M E D. The H is silent, you don't have to pronounce it. So he exhumed the poems later on. I he brought them back. He he dug the tomb and brought the poems back. Okay? So he caused a lot of sufferings to his wife. So that's why he buried the poems with her. It was a kind of uh, doing penance. Later on, 
he exhumed them because he wanted to publish them. One of his poems is called The Canonization. The Canonization. So in this poem, he deals with the sufferings that love causes to the lovers. And at the end of the poem, he says that he and his wife will be canonized the saints of love. So he uses religious imagery to deal uh, with a worldly issue. A worldly issue, i.e. an issue related to the world, related to the body, related to the senses, related to man. Okay. Here, Emily Dickinson is associating summer with resurrection. Okay, so this summer day reminds her of resurrection and of the time of canonizing saints. So in other words, she wants to say that after death, she and her lover will be canonized the saints of love i.e they will be reunited after death they will be resurrected just as jesus christ was resurrected after his death so the whole imagery in this poem is based on uh, the sufferings of jesus christ the last supper that the disciples had with Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, i.e. his death, and his resurrection. Okay, so the whole poem is based on images drawn from the New Testament. So these images are related to the sufferings of Jesus Christ on the cross. They are related uh, to the last supper that the disciples had with him, disciples, D I S C I P L E S, disciples. Okay, so the last supper took place before his crucifixion. It is the time at which Jesus Christ was betrayed to the Romans. Okay. Then he was crucified, he was buried. On Sunday, which is Easter day, he was resurrected. He came back to life. So that's why he deposed the grave. And Emily Dickinson in the poem says, sufficient truth that we shall rise, i.e. we will be resurrected. Deposed at length the grave, to that new marriage justified through Calvary's of love, and love is capitalized. This is a reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, according to Christianity, is love. God is love. Okay? So the sufferings of love, i.e., the sufferings of Jesus Christ, has saved humanity. And Emily Dickinson. Through the sufferings of her love, will be reunited with her lover after death. They will be resurrected and canonized as the saints of love. So that's why I said the whole poem is an images poem, and the images are drawn from the New Testament. So they, these are religious images. Okay. So there came a day at summer's full entirely for me. And we know that uh, summer is associated with what we call summer solstice. Solstice, i.e. it is a kind of change. Okay, so we have two solstice, solstices in the year. Winter solstice, which is the beginning of winter, And winter is a symbol of death. And we have the summer solstice, which is the beginning uh, of summer. And summer is associated with, with warmth, with uh, maturity. 
So the lady associates summer with resurrection, with rebirth. Okay, so it is the season of the saints who are resurrected and who are declared saints. And we know that saints, according to Christianity, uh, are alive. They don't die. Okay? At least their bodies uh, do not decompose in the graves. So there came a day at summer's full entirely for me. I thought that such were for, for the saints where resurrections be. The sun as common, i.e. as usual, when abroad, the flowers accustomed blue as if no soul the solstice past that makes all things new. So the sun rose as usual, the flowers blue, and the fact that the flowers blue is symbolic of life, of rebirth, life after death. The time was scars profaned by speech. Okay, so this is a sacred time. And everything takes place in a state of silence. The symbol of a word was needless, as at sacrament, the wardrobe of our Lord. Okay, so everything takes place in silence. There is no need to express themselves. There is no need for words. Okay, so they are canonized saints of love without the need of language, just as the Christians do not need to have the wardrobe, i.e. the dress of Jesus Christ at sacrament. Okay? Now the sacrament is religious. The sacrament here refers to the holy communion that is given to the Christians at the Mass. Okay? So Christians go to church on Sunday, they pray, this is the Mass, M -A -S -S. they pray, at the end of the Mass, the priest gives them the Holy Sacrament. The Holy Sacrament is what we call the Communion, the Holy Communion. Communion, C O W M U N I O N. The Holy Communion uh, is made up of bread and wine. Okay, so the Christians are given bread and wine at the Mass. Now, the bread stands for the body of Jesus Christ, the wine stands for his. Blood. Okay, so the Holy Communion that is given at church is a communion between the Christians and Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so Jesus Christ at the Last Supper gave bread to his disciples. He says, take this, eat it, it is my body. He gave them wine. He said, drink it, this is my blood. And he said, this is the New Testament that is written in my love, in my blood. Okay, so the Christians Covenant or communion with God, يعني عهد المسيحيين مع الله. To make it clear to you, so the Christians covenant, C O V E N A N T, with God, is accomplished 
through the blood of Jesus Christ, i.e. Jesus Christ was sacrificed so that the Christians will have a communion with God. Okay? That's why Jesus Christ said there will be no more sacrifices. There will be no more bloodshed. Okay? So he is the only sacrifice that has to be paid so that man will have communion with God. I.e. man will be forgiven by God. Okay? So the blood of Jesus Christ is a symbol of forgiving man his sins. Okay, so at the sacrament, the wardrobe of Jesus Christ is not necessary. So, and the same applies to them. So, the atmosphere is a sacred atmosphere. So, they don't need to express their love for each other. That's why they don't need to have words. Okay, so their love relationship is sacred like the religious sacrament that the Christians take at the Mass. Each was to each the sealed church. I.e. she and her lover or beloved are each other's church. Permitted to commune this time lest we, too awkward, show at the supper of the Lamb. So the Lamb here is Jesus Christ. He is the sacrificial Lamb that has been sacrificed. Okay? So she compares her communion with her lover to the supper that the disciples had with Jesus Christ. Okay, so the sacrament, i.e. the Holy Communion, is a symbol of man's communion with Jesus Christ. So it is a symbol of forgiveness. It is a symbol of acceptance. The hours slid fast as hours will, clutched tight by greedy hands. So the time is going fast. So faces on two decks look back, bound to opposing lands. So here we have two faces on two decks. I.e. she and her beloved, and I told you last time that Emily Dickinson fell in love with one of her father's apprentices. He died of tuberculosis, so they didn't get married. Okay, so here we have faces on two decks, i.e. faces on two ships. Look back, bound to opposing lands. Okay, so her lover is bound to the world of death. He is going to the world of death. He is already dead. And she is in the world of life. So that's why she says, faces on two decks, look back, bound to opposing lands. So they are saying goodbye to each other. Okay? And so, when all the time had leaked, Without external sound, each bound the other's crucifix. We gave no other bond. Okay, so she bound her lover's crucifix, and we know that the crucifix is a cross with the figure of Jesus Christ on it. This is the crucifix. Okay, so she bound. Her lover's crucifix, her lover bound her own crucifix. So this is the kind of oath that they make.
this is the kind of oath that they make. Sorry, doctor. Yes. Kind of what? Cross. It is a cross. Oath. Oath. O a t h. A promise. Okay. Okay. So they make an oath. I.e., they are each other's lovers. Okay. So she is his beloved. He is her beloved. So they express this kind of unity, this kind of love, through binding each other's crucifix. Sufficient truth that we shall rise. Okay, so they say goodbye, knowing that they will rise from the dead, they will get united, and they will be canonized the saints of love. So that's why she says sufficient truth that we shall rise. So they will rise from the dead just as Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Deposed at length the grave. So they will defy death. So death separates the two lovers. Okay? So they are separated by death, but later on they will defy death because they will be resurrected. They will be reunited and they will be canonized, the saints of love, just as Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and has defied the grave. Sufficient truth that we shall rise to that new marriage justified through Calvary's of love, i.e. they will be reunited through the sufferings of their love. So she compares the sufferings of their love to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, so this is Emily Dickinson. So the methodology to her poems, the approach to analyzing her poems is imagism. So we analyze her works through the images that she uses. Do you have any questions? Okay, we will go back to the chapter on the research paper. Okay. Last time I showed you how to write a bibliography note for a book written by one author. Okay. Now, sometimes you may use a book written by more than one author. What are you going to do in this case? Now, if you have a book <clears throat> written by two or three authors, you have to mention the names of the three authors. Okay? Now, how do the literature students do it? Get the book, please. Because we have an example in the book. You have the book with you? Yes. Okay. So this page 413. 
Book with two or three authors. This is according to the MLA style sheet. Now, if you have a book written by two or three authors, you have to mention the names of the three authors. Okay? So the name of the first author should start with his family name. Here you have an example. Fisher, comma, Simon. Okay, Fisher is the family name of the first author, right next to Fisher, family name. Kama Saimer, Saimer is his first name. Kama and Rhoda L. Fisher. So this is the name of the second author. Okay. So, Rhoda is the first name of the second author. Fisher is her family name. So, when you have more than one author, you write the name of the first author, you start with his first name, his family name, followed by his family name, comma, then you write the first and the second, the family names of the other authors. Okay, so if you have three, you can write, let's say, Fisher, comma, Simon, comma, then you have Rhoda and Fisher, This is the second author, comma, and if you have three authors. Okay, so there are Fisher, comma, Simon. This is the first author, comma, Rhoda Fisher. This is the second author. And you start with the first name of the second author, comma, you write and, and you write the name of the third. Let's say the third is. Uh, Douglas Brown. You write Douglas Brown, comma. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. So if you have two or three authors, you have to mention the names of the two or the three authors. The name of the first author starts with his family name, followed by his first name, and the names of the second and the third authors start with their first names, followed by their third name, by their family names. Period, then you write the title of the source. Here you have the title of the book. What we really know about child rearing. This is the title of the book. That's why it is underlined. Period, New York, this is the place of the publication of the book. Colin Basic, this is the, pub, uh, the publisher. Comma 1976, this is the date of the publication of the text. You have to memorize these bibliography notes by heart. And you have to memorize the punctuation marks, the commas, the periods, the semicolons. All the columns. Because on the exam, if you make a single mistake, when you write the bibliography note, you will lose the total mark. Okay? So if you start, let's say, with the first name of the author, I will consider it wrong. You will lose the, the total mark for this note. So if it is allocated five, you will lose five points. If it is allocated ten points, you will lose ten points. Is it clear? Yes, doctor. Okay. Now, if you have a book written by more than three authors, you have to do the following. 
write the name of the first followed by it all it all so here you have Schaefer comma Raymond P comma so Schaefer is the family name of the author Raymond is his family name comma it all ET for those who don't have the book all a l two words it all is an abbreviation of a certain Latin expression. It means and others. What does it mean? And others. And others. It means and all others. So we don't have to mention the names of the four or five or six or ten authors that you have. So you mention the name of the first author, which is usually the most important one. And it is usually written at the very beginning. After the name of the first author, you add a comma. Then you write it all. It means and others. Then you mention the title of the source. Here you have the title of a book. Marwana. This is the main title. Colin, a signal of misunderstanding. This is a subtitle. So the title and the subtitle are underlined. New York. It is the place of publication. Colin, N-A-L. This is the publisher. Comma, 1972. So this is for the literature students. So you have to memorize these bibliography notes. So you have a book by one author, a book with two authors or three, a book with more than three authors. You are required to know how to write bibliography notes for sources like these ones. Now the language students should do the following. We have the book. Okay, so if you have numbered the pages of your book, it is page 100. Language students, can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Okay, do you have the book with you? Yes. Okay, so last time we did book with one author. It is entitled Book Single Author. We did it last time. Yes, we did it. Okay, the yes. second bibliography note is entitled Book More Than One Author. Here we have two authors. Okay, so if we have two authors, we list the names of the two authors. We start with the family name of each author. It is different from the MLA. In the case of the MLA, we start with the family name of the first author. Then we write the first name of the the first names of the other authors first before the family name. According to the NBA, we use the family names of the authors. So that's why you have Hill comma M. So Hill is the, the family name of the first author. M is the initial of the first name of this author. You have M period then comma. Yes, you have the period because it is an abbreviation. So it is the initial. It is the initial of his first name. Comma. Then you have and, you have to use this symbol. You don't have to write and. Okay, you have to use this symbol. And Hall, comma, S. Hall is the family name, or Hall is the family name of the second author. S is the initial of the first name of the second author, period. Then you have the date of the publication written within parentheses. Then you have the title of the book, 
woman in the car, it is italicized or it is underlined. Okay? Now, on the exam, you have to underline because you don't have a computer. Period. New York, the place of publication. Column. Yale Press. This is the publisher. Period. Okay? So, this is when you have two authors only. Okay? Now, if you have up to five authors, okay, you have to list the names of the five. Okay? If you have five authors, you have to mention the names of the five authors. In other sources, you have to write the names of the six if you have six. Okay, now we will stick to this source. Okay, so if you have a book written by five authors, you have to mention, to list the names of the five authors. Here you have an example. One, two, three, four, five. We have five authors. So you list them starting with the family name of each author. So here you have Smith. Comma, H period, J period. This is the first and the second name of the first author. Comma, T. This is the family name of the second author. Comma, L period, comma. This is the initial of the first name of the second author. Then you have Song, comma, L, G. This is the third author. Hill, comma, B, J. This is the fourth author. And so we use this symbol. You don't have to write and. Lu, L, U, comma, L, S. This is the fifth author. So Lu is the first, the family name. Lu is the family name of the fifth author. L is the initial of his first name. S is the initial of his second name. Period. Then you have the date of the publication within parentheses. Then the title. It is either italicized or underlined. Period. Atlanta. This is the place of publication. Georgia Press. This is the publisher. Now, if you have more than five authors, If you have more than five authors, you write the name of the first, comma, followed by it all, as we did according to the MLA. If you have more than five authors, you write the name of the first, followed by it all. It means and others. Is it clear? Yes, Dr. Clear. Okay. Then I will do a work in an anthology. Okay, since we are doing the APA format, let's proceed with the APA format. Work in an anthology. Okay. A work in an anthology, it means a poem or a short story or a play or a novel published in an anthology. An anthology is a collection. Okay? An anthology is a collection of literary works. Okay? So we have, let's say, the Norton Anthology of English Literature. Okay? So this anthology 
uh, presents or includes works written by authors over the years. Okay, so the Northern Anthology of English uh, Literature presents works of literature from the 6th century to the present. So that's why you come across works of literature written during the Old English period. You have works of literature written during the Middle Ages. You have works written by authors of the 16th century, author, uh, authors of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century. So that's why we call it an anthology. It is a collection. Okay. Usually, an anthology has an editor. There should be an editor. Okay. So the editor introduces these works. Do you have the Norton Anthology or the Oxford Anthology of English Literature? Do you have these books? Have you ever bought these books? No. Okay. Now, I we discussed uh, Miriam Moore's uh, in distrust of merits, right? Yes. It is, yeah. it is published in the Northern Anthology of American Literature. Emily Dickinson's poems that we have just discussed are published in the American Tradition in Literature. It is an anthology of American literature. Okay, so an anthology has an editor, and the editor is a specialist. Okay, so let's say uh, I am an editor of the Norton Anthology of English Literature, for example. Okay, so usually an editor edits the works of writers of a certain literary period, okay? So I may edit the works written by romantic poets. Another editor may edit works written by Victorian writers. So this is the meaning of the editor. So the editor is a person who is specialized in a certain field of study, okay? So I may be specialized in 19th century literature. So that's why I edit that part of the anthology that deals with 19th century literature. So my duty as an editor is to write an introduction to each author. Okay? I have to write an introduction to each writer, to each poet, to each novelist, each story, short story writer each playwright. So it is my duty to write an introduction to him, to his life, to his career as a poet. I also have to write an introduction to each text, each poem. I may write a brief analysis of each poem. So this is the function of the editor. Okay? So usually we have an editor. So since the anthology has an editor, we have to mention the name of the editor. Here we have, let's say, Thomas J. 1986. So Thomas J. is the author. Right next to it, author. Thomas is the author. A time to sow. It could be an article. And I said, according to the APA, titles of articles or chapters or poems should not be written within quotation marks when we write bibliography notes. When we write bibliography notes, we don't have to enclose titles of chapters or short stories or poems or articles within quotation marks. We don't need that. According to the MLA, we need the quotation marks. Okay, according to the MLA, you have to write it within quotation marks. Now, according to the APA, we have a time to show. This is the title. Let's say it is an article. 
it is neither italicized nor written within quotation marks. Period. Here I have to mention the name of the editor. I write N A Clark. I start with the first name of the author. Okay? So I don't write the first name of the author. I write the initial of his first name. So A is the initial of the first name of the author. Period Clark. Clark is his family name. Then after Clark, I write ED within parentheses. It means editor. ED means editor. And you have to capitalize the E according to the APA. Okay? ED means editor. Comma. You don't have a period here. You have ED period, but it is written within parentheses. Comma, the early Americans. This is the title of the anthology. Okay, this is the title of the anthology. It is a book, so it should be italicized or underlined. After the title, you write within parentheses P P I E pages I E from page the from page one hundred. 95 to page 178. Okay, so within parentheses, you write the pages that the article or the poem or the story or the novel covers. So here the article covers pages 159 to 178. So you write within parentheses, lower case. I a small letter, PP, period, space, 159 to 178. Then you have a period. New York, it is the place of publication. Free Press is the publisher. Is it clear? Yes, doctor. Okay, so this is the title of the anthology. So you write. The name of the author, followed by the date of the publication of the text, followed by the title of the text that is published in the anthology, followed by the name of the editor. After the name of the editor, you write the title of the anthology, then the pages that the article or the text covers, period, then the place of publication and the publisher. Is it clear? Doctor? Yes. May you repeat the MLA? May you repeat how we write then after P? I'm talking about APA. Then I'm talking about APA. I know, but some. We're going to the MLA. Rajalik, Rajalik. Let's go back to the MLA file sheet. Doctor, I am, I am APA. Khalas, APA. But put the the numbers of the pages after the title. Don't you have the book? Yes. Okay. Follow with me. You have the book. I said, you write the title, the name of the author, followed by the, the date of the publication, followed by the title of the text. After the title of the text, you write N and you write the name of the editor. After the name of the editor, you write the title of the anthology. After the title of the anthology, you mention the pages that or the number of the pages that the text covers which color anthology and you have article the anthology with parish of safha 175 is it clear okay Okay, back to the MLA. Okay, you may skip a book with an editor. We will do it later on. Edition other than the first. You have selection in an anthology. You have 
Kafka comma Franz. This is the name of the author. Followed by the title of the text. The metamorphosis. It is written within quotation marks because it is a text published in an anthology. And you should know that the metamorphosis is a novel. <coughs> okay? The metamorphosis is a novel written by Franz Kafka. It is a short novel. And usually, if you have the novel separately, i.e., it is not published in uh, an anthology, you have to underline the title. But here, because it is published in an anthology, you don't have to underline the title. You have to write the title within quotation marks. Is it clear? Yes. Yes, okay. doctor. Then after the title, now here we have a translator. Because we have a translator, you, we have to mention the name of the translator after the title. We have to mention the name of the translator after the title. Here you have trans. It means translated by or translator. You don't have to write the whole word. You write trans, period. Edwin and Mila Moore, you mention the name of the translator. And you start with the first name. Okay? So when you have a translator, you start with the first name of the translator. So Edwin and Mila are the first names of the translators. After the name of the translator, you write the title of the anthology. After the name of the translator, you write the title of the anthology. So it is literature, colon, literature is the main title, colon, reading fiction, poetry, drama, and the essay. This is the subtitle. So this is the whole title of the anthology. It should be either underlined or italicized. After the title of the anthology, you have to write the name of the editor. So you write ED. Okay? ED. You capitalize E because it is written at the beginning, before the name of the editor. ED period, Robert D. Yanni. This is the name of the editor. And you start with the first name of the editor. Okay? So Robert is the first name. D. Yanni is the family name. Period. Now here we have the fourth edition. We write fourth edition. So this is the number of the edition. Okay. Then you have New York. This is the place of the publication of the book, of the anthology. Mac Grow is the publisher. Comma, 1998. This is the date of the publication of the text. Period. Then after the period, you have 215 to 45. What does it mean? Pages. pages. Okay, so you mention the number of the pages at the end of the bibliography note. And you don't need to write PP. Okay, so after the date of the publication, you add a period. And after the period, you mention the number of the pages that the text covers. So the metamorphosis in this case covers the following pages, 215 to, to 245 
of the anthology يعني الصفحات الموجودة عليها the metamorphosis only من الصفحات الانثولوجي كله okay 215 dash 45 so dash 45 means 245 period is it clear clear doctor thank you yes Okay, next time we will do other things. Okay, so the name of the editor should come directly after the title of the text that is published in an anthology. Now, on the exam, I may ask you to write a bibliography note for a text published in an anthology okay so you don't have to write because your friends usually make these mistakes the anthology this is wrong you already have the title of the anthology so if i say the canonization is a poem written by what's his name John Donne, okay, the canonization is a poem written by John Donne, it was published in the Northern Anthology of American Literature in let's say 1996 period, the anthology was edited, let's say, by who is the editor of this book? M. H. Abrams is the editor. The anthology was, was edited by M. H. Abrams and it was published by Longman in let's say London in 1996 so everything is clear so the word the anthology was edited by M. H. Abrams the word the anthology refers back to the Northern Anthology of English Literature so some students on the exam don't write the Northern Anthology of English Literature do you know what they write? they write the anthology as a title of the anthology this is wrong you already have the title. Okay? So the title is The Northern Anthology of English Literature. The title of the anthology in which Emily Dickinson's poems were published is called The American Tradition in Literature. So try to think when you answer the question. Okay? Do you have any questions? No, doctor, everything is clear. Okay. Doctor, so let's... doctor I want to ask yes. a question. What is it? What, well, with respect to the first edition, what does it mean? Who? In MLA style. Yes. Fourth edition. Yes, sometimes we have more than one edition by the of the same book. For example, if I publish, let's say, a book, or if I published a book in 2014, okay? Yeah. Then I republished the book in 2020, okay? Now, sometimes the author makes changes in the first edition. Okay, so if I publish the book in 2014, then I add something to it in 2020, it means that the text or the book that I published in 2020 is the second edition. Is it clear now? Thank you. Okay, now I may add something to the book in 2025, so in this case I end up with the third edition. 
So that's why if you have more than one edition of the same book, you have to mention which edition you are using. Okay, so if we have four editions of the same book and you use the second edition, you have to write second edition. Don't write fifth edition. Because I, as a reader of your research, will go to that book to locate a certain information that you have mentioned. So you if mentioned you use the, the, edition the second you edition, right? Now, I didn't hear you. you mentioned we mentioned the edition that we use it, right? Yes, you mentioned the edition that you use. So if you use the second edition, you have to write second edition. If you use the fifth, write fifth edition. Okay? Now, if the book has one edition, you don't need to say first edition. Usually, when we have a one edition, we don't write first edition. Okay, but when we have subsequent editions, we say second edition, third edition, fourth edition. So if we have more than one edition, and you use, let's say, the first edition, write first edition. If you use the fourth edition, write fourth edition. Is it clear? Yes, thank you. Not at all. Sorry, doctor, can I ask a question? Yes, go on. I'm confusing a little bit uh, about uh, the title of the article. I'm APA student. Uh, when we said, for example, Thomas J. and the date of the publication, we write a time to show. Uh, a time to show is the uh, article written by Thomas about the early American. No, it is published in an anthology entitled The Early Americans. Okay. Okay. So, a time to show is the title of the article or a chapter. I don't know. It is, it is supposed to be an article, not a chapter. Because it is not a book. It is an anthology. Okay. It is published in an anthology. So, the early Americans is the anthology in which the time to show is published. Is it clear now? Yes, clear. And the title of this anthology is uh, what? Anthology yes. of English Literature. The title of this anthology is Anthology of English Literature. Which anthology are you talking about? Uh, the Early American. The Early Americans is the title of an anthology. It has not to do with the English anthology or with yes with the Norton anthology of English literature I gave you the Norton anthology of English literature as an example I said the title of the anthology is the early Americans so we have a Norton anthology now <coughs> Is it clear now? Yes, thank you. Okay, not at all. Okay, at the end of your book, you have a poem by Wilfred Owen. Which page? The last seven pages of the book. The last seven pages of the book. It is page 128, if you have numbered your pages. Can you find it? Yes, doctor. Yes, Wilfred Owen. You have a poem at the end of this page entitled Dulce et Decorum Est. Okay, next time we will discuss this poem. Is it clear? Read it. I will introduce the rhetorical triangle approach 
I will define what rhetoric means, what the rhetorical triangle means, and what are the elements of the rhetorical triangle. Then we will apply them to this poem. Okay? So read the poem so that you will understand the lecture on Thursday. By the way, this is taken from the Oxford Anthology of English Literature. And you have Wilfred Owen. And here you have what we call uh, a head note. We call it head note. This is the head note to the part on Wilfred Owen. So this is what the editor wrote. So the editor usually writes a head note. In the head note, he mentions something about the life of the author. And sometimes at the beginning of each poem or text, he writes a head note to this, uh, to each poem or novel or short story. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. So this is the function of the editor. The editor has to introduce the author or the writer as well as the texts that are published in the anthology. Is it clear? Yes, doctor, very clear, doctor. Okay. Thank you. Not at all. Okay, we will meet on Thursday. Thank you for attending. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you doctor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.